I'm Dr. Angela Yankee. And I'm Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. Welcome back to the Fire Em Up Doctors, Good Medicine Doctors. We are so glad you joined us. We want to provide you with credible health resources, guide you in your treatment options, and fire you up to take control of your health. Welcome back everyone to the Fire em Up Doctors webinar. This is our second COVID update of the series. So um, last month we did one on the second Thursday. We're back here for the second Thursday of April. I can't believe it's April already. So happy spring. Um, today we will be talking about COVID vaccines and variants. So Dr. Aki is going to jump into that. Um, Dr. Kathleen got a little caught up, um, but we're going to have a great conversation today um, guiding you through this pandemic. So welcome Dr. Aki. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing us in, Audrey. And hello, everybody. It's been 13 months now that we've been doing these COVID updates. So thank you for remembering to come on the second Thursday, which we're committed to do until the end of the public health emergency, the PHE. So we're going to do today on vaccines and vaccine variants and a couple little updates. And then the next, we'll meet again sometime in May, the second Thursday in May. So that's today. And then May 13th, we'll be meeting again from 3 to 3.45. And thank you so much. I see everyone who's here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, you've been with me now for over a year. Dr. Kathleen and I have been busy working on a podcast, actually. It's going to be launching at the end of summer, along with our book, Fine Tune Your Immune System, another book. So if anyone wants to take a sneak peek at our, our um our detox podcast draft. I'm looking for feedback in a beta test. About five of you already have it. We really do wanna make it a very user-friendly and useful podcast on detox hormones, fascia, a regenerative medicine, things that we keep hearing our patients ask and we'd like to refer you to it. So if you're interested in looking at our draft detox podcast, just email us and we'll give you a link and you can give us some feedback. In addition, anything you wanna hear about, um, please uh, also give us some suggestions. Here are the update slides. We've changed it a little bit. Um, we're, we're looking at not only, next slide, uh, Alachua County, uh, but Suffolk County in Massachusetts. So uh, in the United States, we've had over uh, 30 million cases, uh, but looking at Florida, 2 million, over 2 million cases. The seven day average, 5,573 with a seven day average of 57 deaths. In Alachua County, uh, seven day average of new cases is 42. But again, what we told you before is those are positives, but it doesn't mean that they're sick because there is a difference between COVID um, positivity, meaning you're, you get screened, but you're perfectly healthy with no symptoms and COVID illness, meaning you're sick, headache, fevers, chills, cough, respiratory symptoms, GI symptoms, You've heard about those ad nauseum for over a year, so uh, they haven't really segregated the difference. But the good news in Elantro County, the seven day average of deaths have been zero and knock wood, we haven't had one, a death in over a month and we've managed over a hundred patients uh, in the past 14 months, five total deaths and everybody was over 75. And when you look at risk of death from COVID, it really does go up with uh, over 65 and much more if you're over 85. Uh, Dr. Kathleen's not here, but they're still quite shut in. I am so grateful to live in Florida. I don't know if y'all realize how blessed we are in Florida. Many states are still locked down where there is no freedom, can't go to work. Um, I'm really happy with the way we're managing um, our, our pandemic here in Florida. Very, very happy to live in Florida. So in uh, Massachusetts, they've had a seven day new case average of 2,142 with a seven day average death of 25. And this is data from March 31st through April 7th. So they're quite busier than we are uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the state of Massachusetts. In Dr. Kathleen's County, Suffolk County, 293 new cases in the past seven days with two deaths. So that county is, is not that much bigger than ours, but yet their, their new cases are much higher. Okay, ne next. 
this is a new statistic that we want to share with you. It's from the Johns Hopkins um, site, and it offers some hope here. So basically, if you look at this line over in the top left, it's talking about this new ratio called the positivity ratio, which is positives uh, over total tests. And in the upper left, you, you see how it's higher uh, about 90 days ago, and it's going down to today, such that uh, five out of about five out of 100 tests are positive. And we want to see that line going down because there's a lot of screening going on as well. So at this point in the United States, for the Johns Hopkins app, um, website, if you get a test, um, when you do a test, about five out of 100 are positive. And we're, we're actually reflecting that within our own office. So that's all good news. Here's a vaccine tracker, and it was accessed today. Um, basically, here in Florida, we've uh, given out many doses, um, and I think that uh, we're almost 20% fully vaccinated, and Massachusetts, 22.3% fully vaccinated, so one in five. Remember, it takes for herd immunity so above 60% of people to have antibodies to develop herd immunity. I heard from... Um, a uh, podcast from the New England Journal of Medicine that, you know, in this week's articles from New England Journal, it talks about worldwide disparities in vaccine access. And um, because there are, <laughs> the first world countries have the vaccines and the poor countries don't. And pretty much left alone, it's going to take four years to develop worldwide herd immunity. Next slide. So a shout out to us here in Florida that they've changed the eligibility to anybody over 40. Now let's go into vaccines. Um, last time, uh, you know this slide, and this came from the US Senate hearing in September. And it seems like a blink of an eye yesterday. I watched that live, but yet it's been over six months. And back then they hadn't released any vaccines, but they were talking about the theories uh, of how they were gonna release the vaccines or the three routes of releasing the vaccines. And you recall like on the upper left, there's the SARS-CoV-2 RNA virus. It's like, a, it's like a tennis ball with spikes coming out of it. Well, the good thing is that spikes are a common target. Unlike HIV virus, um, there isn't a common target, so we haven't been able to find a vaccine. The good thing is about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the common target is a spike protein, which is that heart-shaped um, red thing at the top. I will spend a minute to just give you a head up, getting ahead of myself, but I think it's good to visualize this, that that virus wants to survive. It's evolution, survival of the fittest, and that it's only natural for vaccines to mutate to avoid our immune system, which is represented on the humoral or the antibody side in this picture with the Y over on the right, that's an antibody. It's not even showing the T and B cell um, part of this immune, immune action, but at least the humoral or the antibody part you're seeing. So the way this virus is mutating, because I'm gonna spend the second half talking about the mutations from the UK, from South Africa, from Brazil slash Japan, named for where they first found them, but they're coming into the United States. The only way for this virus is to survive is to change and evade our immune system. So within that heart-shaped spike protein, there is a part of that that's a key to a lock to unlock your into your body called the ACE2 receptor. And that's a binding domain. It's, it's a fancy name, binding domain. It's a part that actually sticks to your ACE2 receptor, which is the lock to get into your cells, to get into your body. Well, the virus has mutated uh, with these variants to avoid our immune system. So that the way I look at, at antibodies, uh, is that the antibody over there on the right looks like a Y. It actually is like when it attach and attach and attaches to that red spike protein, it's like putting gum on a key so the key cannot turn into the lock or your ACE2 receptor to enter your house or your body. So the gum doesn't stick quite as well if it's mutated. 
So therefore the key kind of works and can still get in your body. And that's the way I like to teach and think about mutations. So it's not strange in any way that this virus is mutating. It's biology, okay? So that's the little bit on the mutation, but getting to the three routes of vaccine, because I do want to reiterate a little bit about the J&J &J vaccine, I, which I mentioned last time, but I feel like you're pretty good at that. And you're really good at the mRNA vaccines on the bottom route, all the way at the bottom, Audrey. The bottom route is the mRNA vaccine route, which is Pfizer and Moderna. I think you're good at that one already. We've been talking about that for three, four months. The middle route, see the middle route there where you have the DNA and it's carried in a shuttle called the adenovirus vector to make your spike protein. That actually works with your own genome. The, that is the route of the Johnson, Janssen, excuse me, Janssen or J and J vaccine that's out there. It's a one dose vaccine. It has about 76% efficacy and 100% efficacy against uh, mortality. So that's why the one shot vaccines are currently being used. That's also the route of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is used in Europe and the Russian vaccine called Sputnik. So when you hear about those, that is the middle route, which is DNA, adenovirus vector, vaccine. And finally, I'm going to mention the top route, which is something more traditional in my mind, the Novavax. Um, that's the one I'm holding out for myself personally. It's a more traditional vaccine where you're delivering the spike protein into your body and asking your body to recognize it and make antibodies. Next slide. So just remember um, this one-shot vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, Janssen vaccine. We talked about it briefly last month. Many of my patients have already received this one. So basically, the gene, it's a gene, kind of a gene therapy. And they've used this type of routing with the Ebola virus uh, vaccine. It's been used before, um, but not in huge quantity. So basically, you basically have a virus vector and it, you, have, it's, you put the gene in there for the um, spike protein. It works with your genome to make the spike protein. Uh, and then when the spike protein is exposed by this APC antigen presenting cell, in our book, we call it the bishop, to your lymphocyte, it trains your immune system army. And that's what this is showing. The adenovirus that carries it is from a chimpanzee, and it's thought that because it's not human, our body won't react to the adenovirus vector or the carrier or the space shuttle, whatever you want to call it. My brain, I think of it like um, the, the DNA for the spike protein is like the payload of the space shuttle. Next slide. So the data is pretty good with that one in terms of 76% efficacy and 100% efficacy against severe infection, hospitalization, death. That's what they say. I didn't realize anything could be 100%, but I, that's what I read. Okay, so um, again, so this one, the next one we're going to talk about is the Novavax. And I'm really excited about it. Um, the top route uh, over there with the arrow. And uh, uh, Dr. Mobeen, M-O-B-E-E-N, spent a whole hour on the Novavax. So I'd refer you to that YouTube. He's re reliable. Next slide. So basically, it's, um, it's only in phase three trial in the United States, but they have done a phase three trial in the United Kingdom. It was published on March 11th. However, I don't really like reading or science through the actual manufacturer. I like peer reviewed articles and I couldn't find any peer reviewed articles yet, but at least on their website, um, they said 100% protection against severe disease and 96% efficacy against the original strain of the COVID-19 virus. And it was still effective, but less effective against the UK and South African variants. Next slide. So, um, it was 86% effective against the UK variant and about 55% against the South African variant, but 100% effective against severe disease and death. So pretty good there. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so I would refer you to study um, these graphs. They're from Institute of Functional Medicine, ifm.org. I feel like these, and they're hard to read here and you could certainly go back on the YouTube, but I'd refer you to Institute of Functional Medicine 
to study this, ifm.org. And basically the top um, two rows are Pfizer and Moderna, the mRNA vaccines. And you could look at our previous webinars, but basically 94.5 um, overall efficacy, that's like outstanding. There is some uh, risk of uh, immuno um, problems, anaphylaxis, allergies. I've had two this month uh, on the mRNA vaccines, two patients who got a fat tongue and one had to take Benadryl, almost an EpiPen. And the other I just saw today who, because she was driving her child home from the pharmacy, uh, she didn't want to take the Benadryl, but took an EpiPen home, but didn't have to take it. But she's not, both of them are not getting the second Pfizer vaccine. So really you got to be careful. And it said that um, if you if you carry an EpiPen or high risk of um, uh, allergies or anaphylaxis, you probably don't want to take one of those. So I think these vaccines are individual decisions. I'm really happy to say the senior members of my family have received mRNA vaccines. Certainly if you're 65 with risk factors or above, you should be taking a vaccine. Um, Johnson and Johnson or the Janssen vaccine, only a handful of our patients that thus far have had it. I haven't heard of any um, bad, out, bad side effects at this point within our patient population. I would table the AZ vaccine. The AZ trials have had problems within themselves. And you've heard of some issues with blood clots. I don't think it's coming to the US anytime soon. Uh, so we'll table that until it does. The Sputnik V look again is DNA. It's Russian. It's what they're using in my, my family's home country, the Philippines. Uh, but really don't know much about the Sputnik. It's not available in the United States. The Novavax is what I just shared with you. I've had two patients whose family members are in the phase three clinical trial in the United States, and they are, have developed quite high um, neutralizing antibodies, which is a good sign. I'm not sure when the Novavax will be released, hopefully by the end of summer. Um, next slide. This is the part I want you to look at, because I think it's really useful that this website has put, a doctor website has put together um, the types, the sponsors of the vaccines and theoretical or at-risk populations and outstanding questions. And I would draw you to the outstanding questions because they're all pretty much variations on the same theme. Well, what if I have autoimmune disease? Uh, what about children? What about breastfeeding? What about the next generation? What about fetal development? What about long-term problems? We are all involved in a phase four clinical trial as a nation and international community. It's going to take a while to really look back and see who, who this most benefited, who we may not, we should have given it to, who we shouldn't have given it to, what side effects could have happened. We're learning. We're all learning together. Uh, for example, I have a patient who is a solid organ transplant patient who has had two Pfizer vaccines. His wife developed antibodies and he did not. So then that prompt, you know, at the same time, I'm reading the Johns Hopkins data on solid organ transplants because they're on immunosuppressives to, to um, prevent rejection of their allograft or their donated organ, be it a kidney or a heart. They really, their immune system is suppressed so that they're not developing antibodies. Well, what to do, what to do? So yeah, I call a specialist in another state and I say, so what should I do? And a specialist is kind of what I'm saying. We don't know. This is all an experiment. What is the best thing to do? We're not sure. So I went ahead and supported my patient getting a third vaccine, the J&J &J vaccine, because he failed to develop antibody on Pfizer 1 and Pfizer 2. So like I said, we're just, you know, these decisions should be individually discussed with the best practice for you as an individual and not across the board, in my opinion. Um, next slide. We've had several patients have what you would expect um, with any vaccine in the arm. You could have pain, redness, swelling. In medical school, and I teach medical students so as, as well as my own pre-medical interns, I say uh, rubor, dolor, calor, tumor. Okay, the four classical signs of inflammation. Rubor is red, dolor is pain, uh, calor is hot, tumor is swelling. Those are all classical signs of inflammation. Well, you should expect it because if you have no inflammation, it means that you're not mobilizing your immune system army. And it turns out that if you're getting a vaccine and you have zero reaction, for example, my patient I shared with you, my solid organ transplant patient, he had minimal reaction. 
His wife had felt bad and she developed antibodies. He didn't feel much at all and, and has no antibodies. So you do want those pain, redness, swelling, warmth. It's a sign that your immune system army has mobilized. Well, what about the rest of the body? These are called systemic symptoms and they mimic patients we manage with COVID-19 infection. Why? Because I consider vaccine faux COVID, fake COVID, or a small form of COVID because your body can't tell the difference. So what does COVID look like? Fever, headaches, chills, body aches. Some people have sore throats. Some people had diarrhea. This lady who had baseline gastritis that was quiet uh, developed an exacerbation of her gastritis because it mobilized inflammation in her body. Some people get muscle pain. Some people have to miss work. I will tell that most people after the second dose, I tell them, go ahead and plan two days off of work because you get your baseline, you may have a reaction, but after the booster, you could get a big reaction where you feel really bad for a couple of days. None of my patients have died. None of them have been hospitalized and that's all good. Excellent. I'd refer you to a national database called the VAERS Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. I think it's a very hard website. It's not user-friendly at all. At all. Um, We've tried to report it's hard. We've tried to read it, it's hard. But as of April 1st, there were almost 400,000 adverse reactions reported to the website. And basically you could self-report or your doctor can report. And then also uh, per the CDC and the VAERS website, there was about 2,500 reported deaths of those who received the COVID-19 vaccine. So realize that whenever we give a vaccine, be it flu vaccine, MMR vaccine, any vaccine, we know that there will be vaccine injury. In fact, there's a vaccine injury fund normally. However, that's been suspended for these COVID vaccines uh, in the middle of a public health emergency, meaning that if you get injured from a vaccine, you do not have access to the monies and resources of the vaccine injury fund. If you wanna read more about that, the ethical dilemma, the social dilemma, et cetera. There was good articles in the New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago on that. So yes, we expect injury after these types of uh, public health maneuvers, be it COVID vaccine virus, whatever flavor you have, or any other, I mean, or any other vaccine. So take a look at that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's the part on the vaccines for today. I'm gonna uh, whiz through the variants. So realize the variants, like I said, they're variations on a theme. So basically, if you have uh, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus, that virus will mutate in different ways, not only on the spike protein, but other proteins in the virus in order to survive. Biology is about survival of the fittest. So the question is, if you have like a hand and glove fit and trained your immune system army to make a certain type of antibody to fit perfectly well into the wild type or the baseline SARS-CoV-2 virus, well, what if it mutates, right? I have a little bit of data from CDC to review with you. First of all, I, in this webinar, I reviewed back in January, morbidity and mortality weekly report that said, come March, the number one variant or mutation will be coming from UK. Um, Formerly, formerly known as B117 variant. All right, yeah, it has a higher transmission rate and it actually has a slightly higher death rate. And I'll show you that in a minute. But it turns out that, uh, and it turns out that vaccination, which you saw above with the Novavax, um, is, is, the efficacy is slightly less as is the monoclonal antibodies. So this was from Francis Collins, and I actually think Dr. Collins, MD, PhD, the godfather of the Human Genome Project, uh, NIH director, uh, he is very reliable uh, scientist and very ethical. He recently got an award uh, for his work, his lifetime award, not just COVID. But anyway, I trust him, so I follow him on his blog. So this is what he said. Next slide. Only a week ago, he said that that not only is the UK variant more transmissible, it's actually just a, a little more deadly. But you wanna look at the absolute risk of death. So basically if normal variant, the normal wild type COVID, if you're age of 55 to 69 year old man, you have a 
6.6% risk of death if you were to be sick from the COVID-19 virus. Six out of 1,000 persons, men age 55 to 69 would die. However, if you got the UK variant, that number increases slightly to nine out of 1,000 risk of death from the UK variant. So slightly high, higher, but definitely more transmissible. So what does this mean? I think y'all should still wear masks. I think you should um, be careful as we've always been careful. I do agree with masks, washing hands, physical distancing, staying outside, et cetera. Next slide. So here's another variant um, from South America, the B1351, 50% uh, increased transmission. This is biology, you'd expect it. Also monoclonal antibodies used to treat early and the vaccines also moderately effective, but less effective than the wild type or the regional strain. Next slide. Here is the B1 of uh, the P1 Brazil and Japanese, same thing. And these, you know, these are penetrating the United States in progressive order. So right now the number one variant is the UK. The second is the South African. The third is Brazil and Japan. And just keep watching the CDC website and you'll see. So before I go into the long COVID, I do want to mention that what this means. Um, what this means to us, I think, uh, those who have had the COVID-19 infection, which I'll call the wild type infection, and those who've had vaccines, I suspect uh, people will need boosters. I don't know, we're still trying to understand the science about how often those boosters will occur. Will it be every season like the flu? We don't know, the science is still being gathered. I'm gonna take a slight turn to talking about long COVID. This was a good article published within the past month on low COVID, long COVID only because I'm gonna give you a resource that actually is useful. So they say that about of half people who experience COVID will have symptoms of some sort at hundred days and probably get better after. As you all know, I'm working on a clinical trial using regenerative medicine to help my long COVID patients because I was so horrified people were, had lingering fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath, can exercise, muscle aches. And you know, that's to me, that's mitochondrial or powerhouse of the cell got injured or they had persistent inflammation or what's called oxidative stress or um, rusting, yeah. So I've been managing several long COVID people but I'm down to like two. So I don't even have enough to put my own trial uh, at this point when that's a blessing. Um, but anyway, I do wanna share this website uh, that looks at stasis breathing that basically it involves inhaling and exhaling through your nose in a prescribed way twice a day. And the breathwork pilot program with long COVID patients showed there was improvement in as short as a week. So Google this and try to get in. It's free, the stasis breathing programs. And why is that? Well, I actually think that because breathing and oxygen help to decrease reactive oxygen species are rusting in your cells. So anyway, I actually believe in breathing so much for other things like anxiety, chest pain, muscle aches, optimal health, wellness, exercise, aficionados, that I actually, within my own private practice, have a group medical visit called Breathing is Medicine breathing as medicine, because breathing is medicine in my opinion. But in terms of long COVID, if you have that, uh, join that group on, it's called Stasis Breathing, just Google it. I will also share that one of my patients who had, um, who was hospitalized with COVID about uh, six or seven months ago, um, she had everything with me, even um, progressive therapies, including intravenous nutritional therapy, uh, still got worse than her lungs, got admitted to the hospital for five days, uh, got remdesivir, uh, high dose steroids, um, got monoclonal antibodies, I'm sorry, got polyclonal antibodies, donation antibodies at the time, um, suffered with long COVID for six months. And I read the literature and actually gave her ivermectin uh, even though there's only one small trial of ivermectin for treatment of long COVID, she said within 90 minutes of the first dose of ivermectin, she noticed a switch and she was meeting up with her friends outside for lunch and she just couldn't quit talking about it. So she had a, she had a good switch. She, something happened to decrease the inflammation in her body um, for, for, with the use of ivermectin for uh, attempted treatment for 
long COVID. So she's on week two of that protocol. And again, I searched the literature. There's not a whole lot on protocols for long COVID and the use of ivermectin. But the way that ivermectin works is it's anti-inflammatory. It's also antiviral. Next slide. Okay. Uh, speaking of, I still like this. I still like this group uh, called the Frontline COVID nineteen Critical Care Alliance. It's head by Dr. Paul Merrick, who's behind the scenes. He's from Eastern Virginia Medical School, head of critical care medicine. We quoted him and did a shout out to him in our book that published in May of last year. Uh, he formed this group and the president is Dr. Pierre Corey, K-O-R-Y. I'd refer you to him, just Google him. Fantastic group, makes a lot of sense. Been managing people extremely well with these protocols plus. So I say that we follow these, but we add, we add our own twist um, and, and seem to be doing really well with management of our patients. Okay, so I'll open it up for Audrey to pitch me any questions that might've come along the way for a couple minutes and we'll wrap it up for today. Alrighty, um, I'm gonna check the chat to make sure that I'm caught up on everything. Okay, so um, Sheila asked, why do people get themselves screened if they don't have any symptoms? Oh, yeah. So my, my son's a D1 athlete. So the athletic people will do it. Um, people who, the, some people are requiring it before travel. So basically, if you know symptoms and you want to be checked, you can check it. At least it's not covered by insurance, but there's many places, including our office, that'll give you that option uh, to screen. Okay. And I don't know the percent of people vaccinated in Alachua County. I don't know that that's published. Um, should you be tested for antibodies after vaccine? That's a great question, Jean. I am testing certain people. I'm testing certain people and we can test it through either standard labs, Quest or LabCorp. We can measure quantitative antibodies for the spike protein. I'm testing it in certain people who I think are high risk. Remember the efficacy of the vaccine was only 94.5% for both Moderna and Pfizer. And also remember that there's about six out of 100 people who don't make antibodies anyway. Now, I think to say that antibodies are the only factor in protecting you and your immune system against the, the COVID-19 virus is only partially correct because you not only have the antibody or the humoral immune system, you have the cell mediated immunity, which are T cells, memory T cells and memory B cells. The problem is it's hard to measure memory T cells and memory B cells. It's easy to measure antibodies. And that's why I think antibodies are a good measure, but it's, it doesn't necessarily tell the whole story um, what, in terms of immunity, but it's the best we have. Okay, and then um, this will keep going down the list. Um, did you want me to read out the acetaminophen? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I was taking acetaminophen before and after my sh first shot due to shoulder pain. Did I cancel the positive effect of the shot? Can I get tested for antibodies? Okay, so first of all, acetaminophen is also known as Tylenol trade name. It does not affect inflammation, so that uh, that shouldn't have affected it. I try to keep my patients from using ibuprofen around the vaccine that uh, or other type non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, because I, I do want inflammation. So if you are having side effects around the vaccine time, go with Tylenol first. And in my patient population, if you spike a temperature greater than 101.5 and the Tylenol is not holding you and a cool bath's not holding you, then go ahead and take ibuprofen. If you want to try to check antibodies um, under your insurance, uh, we'd have to find a reason. So have, make a telehealth appointment with any of our team. Perfect, thank you. Um... What to do with family members who are anti-vaxxers, if anything? <laughs> that whole discussion. So I, I actually think vaccines used prudentially and judiciously on in people different situations is actually a good thing. I think vaccines have saved a lot of lives. So to say you're anti-vaxxers, I'm not going to take an, a vaccine for anything. I, it would be an individual discussion. I would say that that if you're at risk and you're over 65 and you have people that might transmit to you, I'd still be careful. Even if I've had the vaccine, I'd still be careful, especially because you just saw the rates of decreased efficacy of these vaccines with the uh, variants that are coming around. Perfect. And then Nancy asked, I had no reaction to my vaccine shots. Should I be tested for antibodies? You could. I haven't seen any papers that specifically say if you had zero, then you have zero, this percent react, 
po positivity or this positivity, but um, it makes sense that if basically the um, those of you who have looked at our, our book or have listened to us, the communication, the messengers called interleukins, okay, those are just chemical messengers between the white blood cells. Hey, come here. Let's learn this antibody. Let's learn this antigen. Let's make this antibody. These are called interleukins. These are signals like on a football field to your immune system. They come with things that signal the brain like, oh my gosh, let's mount a fever or oh my gosh, let's have chills. So if there's no activity at all, you wonder if your immune system army has been mobilized at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. With the mutated COVID virus, do you know which one a person has if they test positive, if it is original COVID-19 or UK or South Africa variant? Yeah, so the standard labs under insurance are not testing variants yet. It's being directed by the CDC who's get, getting te variants tested. Um, but like Dr. Kathleen says, this is an extremely sophisticated crowd to even ask that question. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting some awesome questions in here. Um, Christina Miller asks, many of my younger teachers are having a very severe reaction to the second shot and even the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine shot. Older teachers are not. Are there explanations for this? And if younger people are more prone to a bad reaction, how safe would vaccinating children be? <laughs> I have strong feelings about that, but you should come to my group medical visit separately. So basically, um, there's just generalities. If you, if, when we dissected in my science study group, the Pfizer data back in January, it looked like there was 94.5% efficacy in people over 65 and under 65. But if you looked at the adverse reaction rate, it was much more in younger adults. And we were supposing this is because your immune system is younger, it's more exuberant. So the question in our mind was, should we decrease the dose for younger people? If you in the end have the same efficacy, but you have much more side effects in the 40 to 65 year old group, as opposed to 65 and over, shouldn't we adjust the dose? And so, yeah, it's good observation. As for children, I'm gonna to defer to the CBC, but if you're my patient, you could talk to me individually about your own family. Um, okay, last one. I also have no reaction. I'm wondering also if I could check for antibodies. So that was just responding to someone else. So it looks like that was all the questions. And if you okay. guys have more, feel free to send them in to the Fire Up Doctors Gmail. And we'd be happy to answer them um, through the email or during our next COVID update. But thank you guys for being so interactive and making this a great conversation. Yeah, shout out to all of you guys. I'm looking at the list of who's here. Many of you have been here to every one in the past 14 months. No wonder you're so sophisticated. So for now, everybody, be safe, be well, and God bless you all. And thank you, Audrey, for co-hosting. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you again, Dr. Aki, for that great conversation. I'm so grateful for her guidance through this entire pandemic and really committing to um, being with all of her patients and updating them throughout this whole thing. Um, so it's so awesome to be a part of this process. And before I let you guys all go, I'm going to offer up the supplements and books we have um, for this week. So um, at our Fire Up Doctors Get Healthy store, um, right at the top, we have all of our supplement bundles. So you can just click on the supplement bundle and you don't have to worry about adding these all individually to your cart. And so this is the basic immune pack. And this pack is great for um, COVID prevention, but also just to fortify and strengthen your immune system in general. Um, so we have up top the CDOS protocol. We have the neurobiologics vitamin C. Um, we have two options for vitamin D. The one on the left is going to be the D3-2000, and that's the non-vegan version. And then on the right, we have the liquid vegan version. And then we have um, Pro Omega 2000, um, that would be the standard version. And then the Algae Omega would be the vegan version. Um, and then the last, the Z and the CDOS protocol is our Pure Encapsulation Zinc 30. And then the plus is going to be your Pure Encapsulations Quercetin. We also have the Colloidal Silver Spray and then the Neo 40 um, lozenges. And so this entire pack, um, if you were to take it, is less than $5 a day. So if you think about that, it's less than an expensive Starbucks copy um, just to strengthen and fortify your immune system. Um, so it's a great deal and you don't have to worry about picking these supplements out individually. We've curated this pack so that you can just add it right to your cart. So that would be on the Fire Up Doctors Get Healthy store.
And then we have our post-exposure prophylaxis protocol. So this bundle is the same framework as the basic immune pack, um, but you're going to triple the CDOS protocol. So that top line with the vitamin C, the vitamin D, um, your omegas and zinc, you would triple that protocol if you were exposed to someone who was a confirmed positive COVID case um, and you're trying to prevent yourself from getting sick. Um, and then in the bottom is the same, except the only thing we're adding is the immune PRP spray. Um, and again, that bundle is available in the standard version and also the vegan version right at our Fire Mug Doctors Get Healthy store. All of the bundles are right at the top and your vegan version is gonna be the green color and then the um, standard version is gonna be the blue. So that's what we have for our supplements and we'll move right into the books. Um, so we're still recommending our kit COVID-19 um, guidebook. So this guidebook has been a great resource to use throughout COVID and many of our patients have come back and said that it was helpful um, with their families or themselves struggling through COVID. It has so much great information and is awesome throughout this series. Um, and just as we go through the pandemic to um, fortify your immune system and to keep yourself healthy um, to guide you through COVID. Um, so we're still having our April special where if you buy the guidebook, either um, online copy or physical copy and you send us a proof of receipt, we'll go ahead and give you 20% off the ultra potent vitamin C and then the zinc AG. So if you just email that, um, we'll go ahead and give you that coupon code. And the ebook is available for $9.99 on Amazon Kindle, Google Play, and Barnes and & Nobles, and then for $14.95 on Audible. Um, and just a reminder for you guys, if you're new to Audible and you make an account, your first book is free. So you could actually use your first little coupon token um, to get this book for free. And we also lastly have um, a few paperback copies still left in office, and those would be $29.99. Um, so you can email or call us to pick those up. And then Secondly, we have our Fine Tune Your Hormone Symphony um, guidebook, and we're actually working on a um, sequel to this book about immune systems, but this book is awesome to give you a framework on how to balance your hormones um, to create a really optimal sense of holistic health and wellness. So this book is available on audible.com and then also on our firemupdoctors.com website. And lastly, we have um, Dr. Aki's Fascia Function and Medical Applications textbook. Um, so we have paperback copies still in the office. And if you email nfimgmv at gmail.com, um, we can offer this book for curbside pickup for $55. And it's also available on our firemupdoctors.com website and Amazon. And this book is actually going to go along perfectly with a podcast episode we're working on. We recorded with um, one of Dr. Aki's good friends and specialists on fascia. So um, make sure to get this book so when the podcast launch, you'll have um, all that information. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this week. And our next COVID update will be um, the second Thursday of next month. So we really look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for tuning in and being interactive. Um, and please send in any ideas if you have about the podcast or just any other questions. We're always here for you and happy to help. So thank you so much and see you next month. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope we've given you the tools to take control of your health. For more good medicine and information about any treatments, supplements, and resources discussed today, please visit us at www.firemopdoctors.com. That's F-I-R-R-I-M-O-Doctors.com. And wherever you're listening from, remember to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels so you don't miss out. The information provided is not a substitute for professional medical advice. This should not be used to diagnose, treat, or manage health problems without consultation. If you do experience any of the symptoms discussed today, please contact your nearest healthcare professional.